Today I made a post on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube talking a little bit about my story and I realized that not a lot of people actually know or I should say there's a lot of people who have joined in the past couple of years that don't really know my story and I want to walk today through why I do what I do and uh, what led me on my entrepreneurial journey to get to where I am today. Um, I didn't have a lot of money. My family didn't growing up. Um, my dad was a minister. He still is. And we moved like 26, 27 times by the time I was moving out and we were moving all over the country. I was actually born in Kentucky, Louisville. And then we moved to Tennessee. Then we moved to, uh, Arizona. And then when I was like three or four years old, we moved up to Washington state where to this day I still live. And, uh, when I was really young, I, I, I was ahead in school. And so I actually started with my brother at home. He started kindergarten when he was five. I started, I was, at, I was three, so I just like sat there and learned because there was nothing else to do. I just played with my brother all day long. So when we moved, I was four years old. We moved to uh, come up to Washington State. He started school uh, in, in grade one. And I was like, forget this. I'm not like, going to live without my brother at, work, at, at home all day long by myself. So I'm going to go to school too. So I started uh, kindergarten officially when I was four years old, but it was always pretty easy for me because I, I always had that year up. Like when I was three, I was learning how to write and all the rest of it. I get into kindergarten and I was already ahead of the game. Well, I was still a year ahead even at that time in terms of being four years old in, in kindergarten. So I was really small, still am really small to this day. Surprise, surprise. And so my mom held me back a year. And so I did kindergarten again. So Although it was the second time, technically, I'd kind of done it three times by now. And so it really get me, gave me a good foothold and kind of set the precedent that like, hey, you're going to be the one that is ahead in class. You're going to be the one that teaches your, uh, your uh, other uh, classmates on how to do work. Once you're finished your project, you help other people. Very helpful for me. I learn really well when I teach people. I learn myself. It, concepts come together really well when I'm teaching others. And uh, I didn't know it obviously back then, but like um, something that throughout all my primary years of school that was happening. So uh, I was in grade seven. I skipped grade seven. Uh, after like a week or two into the school year, they finally let me skip. I was just bored out of my brain. And I told my mom and dad, I was like, I, I want to skip grade. It has nothing to do with anything other than just like, I'm bored in my brain. I feel like most of my day is a waste. So they let me skip grade seven. That was a really good move. Def definitely put me in a different, uh, a, a challenging environment. Did grade eight. And then that's when I realized that I could go uh, take, do homeschool, do grade nine and 10 in one year, and then start grade 11 and 12. But while doing grade 11, and 12, also go to college and get my undergraduate degree, start working on that. So that's what I did. Uh, I basically started going to college when I was 13 years old, going to Wacom community college, got my first two years, of my associate's degree, and then transferred over to Western Washington university. Now in that time, I believed that I was going to go to medical school. I wanted to either become a heart surgeon or a brain surgeon. And either of those, I wanted to go extremely specialized and I wanted to focus on emergency. I really like definitely wanted, I, I just knew from the beginning, I, I loved high stress situations and I wanted it to be where when someone came in, their life was literally in my hands and that's, that was the adrenaline I wanted to have. And so um, I prepared and I worked hard and literally nothing besides an A in college was the standard. Like my standard was if it's not an A, I failed. It was either literally fail or an A. And I still remember getting my first A minus in my uh, second year of college and literally going to the, the, the professor and being like, I will do whatever it takes to get that change to an A. And it was crazy. She had me do an extra paper and a little bit of research is in a nutrition uh, class and I got my A. And so anyways, fast forward a little bit more. And, and by the way, like I started college when I was really young, but my parents had no pressure on me whatsoever. They never cared about my grades. They didn't ever push me to go to college early. In fact, they actually said like, Hey, like we're not pushing you. You don't need to start early. You can take some time off, like things like that. But ultimately when I knew that I was going to go to college, I want to get over kind of, sorry, when I, when I knew that I was going to go to medical school, I kind of want to get over as soon as possible. Cause like I knew I was going to be in school for another 10 or 12 years, seeing that I wanted to become a surgeon and really go deep into the medical field. And when, when we knew we were going to go to college early, my brother and I both started mowing lawns. At the time, we called it Andy's Lawn Care. It's my last name, Andy's Lawn Care. I was 11. He was 13. We started getting a bunch of lawns in our local neighborhood. And then basically, once he got his driver's permit at 15, we were able to start getting lawns outside of our neighborhood. 
and really kind of expand. So when I turned 18 years old, I was fully anticipating to go to medical school. I probably was going to go to LSU, but it wasn't confirmed yet. Um, I ended up my last quarter of school going to Nairobi, uh, Kenya, and around Nairobi. So Takoni, Kalangwari, um, to different hospitals and orphanages, uh, doing a lot of medical kind of stuff. So I did everything from the birthing uh, to uh, the burn unit. We did some minor surgeries, did lots of injections, and there's a lot of vir- uh, viruses over there and, and things like that. So uh, that was my life. It was literally the coolest thing in my whole, like everything I had dreamed of and worked for what for, for years in college had now become like I was able to do it. I was literally in a, in a doctor's jacket. I was being called doctor. Like that was like the dream. It was literally like playing house as a kid, this was now playing doctor. And I was able to do all this stuff because obviously over there, there's not as much rules and regulation. And it was like, we were just helping people. It was a nonprofit. And so if someone came in, it was like, whatever you can do to help this person is going to be better than them having nothing. And so it was a phenomenal, a phenomenal experience. Uh, and, uh, I came back to the U S and decided that I didn't want to do medic- medicine in the U S uh, mostly due to the fact that I didn't want to go really deep into a profession and, and a specialty and then be stuck in doing the same four or five, six procedures. Is That's what happens when you get really, really specialized. It, I, I didn't want to do that for the next 40 years of my life. Just, that was not interesting. And furthermore, I didn't want to deal with paperwork and insurance and the bureaucracy that comes along with the medical system. And so um, that was a, a really weird time for me. I came back. I was 18 years old. I graduated and like kind of walked the aisle. And this is where the picture came from. If you check out my Instagram or Facebook from today, uh, you know, very happy time for most people. It was like graduating. I was the youngest graduate from Western Washington University um, ever. And uh, it was weird, though, because for the first time in my life, I didn't really know what was next. And um, it was a little bit scary. Uh, I was supposed to be the Doogie Hauser young kid going to college and becoming a doctor really young. And here I was, 18 with a graduate degree and had no idea what I was going to do. Um, so I started lawn care. I was like, you know what? I'm going to take this thing, make it bigger. So that's when I started Augusta lawn care. Fast forward a couple of years later, I got in an, in an accident underneath the dump truck and in the PTO, the power takeoff of the dump truck, it sucked up my hoodie, grabbed every, my shirt, and my hoodie up around my neck and, uh, almost killed me. And, uh, by the grace of God, I was able to fall out of the PTO and it ran, it miraculously kind of just like split down the middle with it being bunched around my neck split. Uh, there was no seam, there was no zipper. And I still very distinctly looking up as it was trying to suck me underneath, looking out from underneath the dump truck and thinking this is how it's going to end. And it wasn't like I was afraid. It was like, Oh, like this is how it's going to end. And I'm a religious person and I was ready to go and I try to live my life that way. And so I wasn't like fearful. It was just like, Oh, like this is just happens immediately because like I was underneath there trying to fix the PTO and engage it engaged caught my hoodie and within a second I was like oh this is how how it's going to end I dropped out uh, ended up going to the hospital and there's some pictures that I should share today from it um online but uh yeah it just took a couple weeks of me being out uh they didn't want me doing much work and I still have scars on my inside of my arm uh my most of my chest doesn't grow hair because of all the, the impacts and the amount of uh, compression that happened, all the hair follicles and stuff. So it messed me up a little bit, but I, I was fine after a couple of weeks. But during that time, I realized that my business wasn't built on systems and it couldn't run without me. Even though it was a good business, uh, by that time we were doing probably seven, 800,000 in revenue. Um, it was, uh, it couldn't run without me. It depended on me being there every day, selling the jobs, getting the crews to do the work, uh, showing them the projects and just did not run on systems. And so uh, during those couple weeks, it was again, a kind of a, uh, a punch in the gut because here I was the person that everyone expected to become a doctor. And my parents put no pressure on me. didn't have a lot of expectations like on me at all, but like definitely everyone else did. Um, all my peers, the, the, uh, professors that I was going through, I did a lot of research. I was spent a lot of time in the lab physiology, kinesiology, biomechanics, all those classes, you're getting to meet these professors that are are very invested in seeing someone so young coming through their program and succeeding. And I still remember when I made the decision to not um, go after the medical field and getting emails from professors. And I wish I would have kept them. I think I deleted them because I was was not happy at the time. Um, But I remember very specifically getting those emails from them saying like, you're making a massive mistake. You're uh, wasting talent. That was the one that stuck in my head. And so now flash 
forward now to a couple years later, I have now realized that the business that I've built and I've poured myself into for the past couple years is basically worthless because it can't run without me. And I basically have a job and that is working 80, 90 hours a week trying to get this to keep this thing afloat. And now without me, it doesn't, it can't keep growing and expanding and it doesn't have a, a, a team and systems in place that run without me. And uh, yeah, sitting in your bed and just like, oh yeah, great. So I've, I've really wasted all this expectation and skill. And even a, a few years away from medicine, you get rusty, like in terms of knowing the anatomy and physiology and uh, the, all the different biomechanics and things that I had studied. And I had done so much work on MS and multiple sclerosis and uh, did a lot of research on, on that specifically. And um, yeah, like, it was just like, oh, like maybe I, maybe I was supposed to go do something else. Maybe I was supposed to go keep working on MS um, stuff and I would have been able to find some sort of drug or some sort of therapy that could have helped with that. Um, and you just question everything that you've been doing. Like here I'm mowing grass and I was supposed to be the you know, you know child prodigy. And so you question yourself. And the reason I share this story is because I think a lot of us come to these places in life, whether it be college and not knowing what you should do next, or whether it be working for years in your business and realizing that you really don't have a business and it's basically just a job and you don't have systems and um, you can get really low during that point. And I know what it's like. And so when I talk to business owners or I talk on stage and people are like, man, you're like really passionate. And you're like, I know exactly what people are feeling like. And every time I talk to people on stage or in a video, I try to convey the, the passion that I have for that person that's in that low, low moment. And um, I know it's like, it's not fun. And especially when expectations of other people were so high and you feel like a failure, uh, I know what it's like to be there. And so those are two very pivotal moments. And we always talk about change and transition as such a, a positive thing. And typically in the long run, they are. However, going through it, it's not fun. It's not something that I would wish on my worst enemy. Uh, to feel that way. And honestly, as, as as time goes on in your entrepreneurial journey, like things are always going to be a challenge. There's never going to be a moment when you break through and there's a, this, everything just gets easier. The only re way that happens is if you start to plateau or you, and you stop growing, but a true entrepreneur to actually really succeed typically doesn't have the mindset of I'm going to achieve a certain level and then just I'm going to stop. Like I would rather die than have an organization or be the leader of an organization that reaches some sort of level of success and then plateaus and never really changes or grows or continues to give back or improve. Uh, and and I, just, I just have no interest whatsoever in doing that. But by, by having that sort of mentality and by pushing yourself and always growing the business and, and growing and expanding and making your company bigger and having more team members, you're always going to be putting yourself in positions where you feel uncomfortable and nervous. And that doesn't change, by the way. Um, don't ever think that a certain size business or if you look to someone up to someone that like somehow they get to a certain level and like they're just immune to stress and, and anxiety and, and depression. And like that doesn't happen. So, um, don't think it does it. You're, you're putting a false mirage in front of yourself. That's, that's not how it is. Um, even as I speak to talking to you right now, it's in the middle of the night and I'm just kind of recording this raw because right now I feel the same way. Um, that is we're, we're launching copilot in just a matter of a couple of weeks and we're going to roll it out to hundreds of business owners. And, um, there, there's a big part of it that I can't control. And that's the technical aspect. I control a lot of elements, but I don't know how, know the, the back end code. I know some little bits of code. I did some apps and things like that when I was in college, um, a couple of iOS and Android apps, but, um, I, there's elements I can't control. I'm definitely nervous about the rollout. Uh, having that many new people into a new software so close to the spring rush, it's crazy. Um, we've only really been working on the project for about four months and, and getting the, the code base ready. And uh, I'm confident, but there's st I'm still very, very afraid and scared. And it, I, it keeps me up. Uh, and it, I know that it'll be the most public humiliation in the world if it flops. And um, the last thing I want to do is put anyone's business in jeopardy by having them switch to my CRM that I've promoted and then it not do well. And um, so you put a lot of pressure on yourself. I think anyone that builds great products and services and builds great teams is going to have that level of pressure on themselves and you're going to feel that way. And there's going to be times when in your entrepreneurial journey, when you question yourself, you don't know what the next step is. Like in my college days, there's going to be times when you question yourself, you're like, did I make a mistake? Like I was feeling sitting in a hospital, realizing that my business potentially was worth nothing. And I had nothing to show for the years that I'd spent on it. And, um, so, you know, I got out of the uh, hospital and, uh, kind of repaired myself physically. And then determined like, Hey, you know what? We're going to build systems. We're going to build procedures. And so basically I, started a landscape business course not too far after to basically just chronologically look at how I rebuilt the business and the systems and procedures and the things that I believe really worked. 
and it was great and it was fine. And I made lots of videos, hundreds of videos to help landscapers and business owners in the lawn care industry, uh, hopefully improve their business. And I realized that literally 1% of people were actually taking what I was, I was talking about and implementing it. And it was very hurtful and hard because I saw them going through the same painful realizations, uh, the pain, painful realizations that business could not run without them. It didn't run on systems. It ran, it ran on their personality and their ability to sell, their ability to uh, lead. It did not run on, there was no systems for sales. There was no systems for hiring. There's no systems for onboarding. There's nothing. And um, they made sure, they had to make sure they had someone to answer the phone. They had to, have, they had to make sure that some, there was someone to do payroll. And that there was no system and process for scaling in the organization or doing multiple locations or let alone bringing people that were starting out at the bottom of the organization and bringing them up and having upper mobility and allowing people to become managers or start their own location. There was none of that. And um, I kept seeing that. And while I was teaching in Landscape Business Course, I truly believe it would help them, but it was not getting through. And so that's when I started Augusta Lawn Care, the franchise. And the, the, the main objective in doing that was so that I could have skin in the game with these other owners that when I said something, they would know that what I'm saying is exactly what I believe and I have skin in the game and their brand is my brand. So why would I tell them something that is not good for them? And um, I wanted to prove that the systems work. And I knew that if I could do that and scale it up and we could be in hundreds and potentially thousands of locations down the road that all the competition in the lawn care landscape industry that were competing with us at a local level inside of each of those markets would eventually have to adopt the systems, not because they thought I was good or because I, they heard about me, but because they had to in order to stay competitive with Augusta Lawn Care. And that's why we started the franchise three years ago. And back then I said, give me five years and I'll make Augusta Lawn Care have a unique and, and, and competitive advantage that it cannot be duplicated. So we still have two more years to do that. Uh, and I've been very clear to the franchisees for the past few years that our, our play over the next five to 15 years will be software. And then after 15 years to 20 years, it'll be robotics. And that my energy, my time will be spent over the next few years focusing on software. And last year, we went ahead and cemented the partnership where I own 60% of Copilot CRM.com. And that's just the beginning of what I believe is so important because with software, I can duplicate the systems. I can duplicate what I'm teaching and put it into a, a software that people are using every single day. It's so connected and integral to their business and integrated to their business that I can not just, someone doesn't have to watch a video to understand their numbers. They don't have to watch a video to understand close ratio and the importance of it in their business. They can, it, the, 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 the software can tell them what to do. It can use AI to actually predictively tell them when to hire people instead of just having to watch a video, know who I am. You don't need to know who I am to, to improve your business. And so these are the things I'm passionate about. This is what we're trying to build. And um, regardless of whether or not you're in that first stage where you just don't know what's next, stage two, that was when I realized that the business I had built and put my, put my blood, sweat, and tears into was worth absolutely nothing. I had no systems, I had no procedures, and it all ran on me. Um, or, whether or, not, or whether you're in growth phase and you have gone through a lot of the different phases and there's millions of dollars in revenue that I make every year and um, probably 100 plus employees that work directly for me. And now I have... Um, eight locations that are Augusta Lanka that I own, North Carolina, Connecticut, and Washington State. Um, those are all fine and good. Um, but the entrepreneurial journey is, is not easy. It's not, it's not fun. It's, it's not one that I would wish on someone that should not be in that position. I wouldn't. Um, it's hard. It's difficult. There's a lot of sleepless nights, times where you will feel anxious, especially in the first three to five years. It's extremely difficult because growth sucks cash. So you have the financial pressure of trying to grow and expand into something that you've never done before. And so it's testing your physical, mental, emotional leadership abilities. And it's very, very difficult. It's lonely and discipline is extremely hard to mold and craft your character. And I was talking to the franchisees today. It is really deprivation. Like you're depriving yourself of what would, what feels good and what feels comfortable and what feels average and what would make you feel nice. That's what discipline is. And that's what is required as an entrepreneur. And that's why I'm so against, and that's why people ask me like, why are you so against what entrepreneurship has become online and social media is because it's encouraging people and, and it is tantalizing people to become entrepreneurs and business owners that should not be. And I truly believe that it'll push people to uh, mental places they should not go and depression if they try to become an entrepreneur and a business owner when they should not be one. Most people should not be. And I don't say that because it, they're it, by saying that it makes me better. It's, it's not that most people should not be an entrepreneur and it's okay to realize that you've potentially gone into becoming a business owner or an entrepreneur and you're not one. 
it's not for everybody. It will, it, you can really hurt yourself. The mental strain that comes along with it when you're really pushing yourself, when you're really going for it, when you really want to cause change, when you're really trying to grow fast um, and create more jobs for your community and, and create wealth for you and your family, there's a lot of struggles. There's a lot of pain and there's a lot of anxiety that comes along with that. And so I know I'm sometimes somewhat painting a dark picture of what entrepreneurship is, um, but I feel like I have to balance out the other side that says so often the times that it's fast cars and making money quickly and easily and working a few hours a week and traveling the world and posting pictures on Instagram. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. 1% of my day is social media. 1% of my day is fun and exciting and, and strategy and in the clouds. Most of it's in the dirt. Most of it is very hard. Most of it is worry. Most of it is financially trying to make sure the business stays afloat, make sure strategy, making sure the team is taken care of, making sure the people that depend on me are taken care of. That's very stressful. So that's kind of my story in a very small nutshell. I hope the videos I make, um, hope, hope this story clarifies why I make the videos and why I do them the way that I do them. And um, I truly believe that um, one day the things that I talk about, whether it be software, what I want to do with the landscape industry and, and raising this level of professionalism will become true. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. So maybe this video will be inspiring to someone in five or 10 years when, when they watch it then. But anyways, thank you so much. I appreciate all of your support. Uh, MikeAndy's.com has more information about all the other stuff I do, um, but very passionate about these things and uh, hope you have a great day. Take care.